Well then, hello everyone. Welcome back to uh, Chihon Teaches. A uh, long time no see, I'm back. Uh, but I'm not back alone. Uh, as you will know, um, the overall goal of this channel is not just, you know, to highlight ancient philosophy, which, which is, you know, my personal strength, but also to uh, bring philosophy to everyone as much as I can. So today I have a, one of my dearest friends who happens to be an expert in a particular field um, in philosophy. So uh, my friend is Diego Morales, which is here with me. Uh, so hello, Diego. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, great, great. So um, today, um, well, first of all, I will let Diego to introduce himself, uh, give him some time to, you know, uh, explain why is he here. And also, yeah, just tackle uh, the first of the questions I have for him. So please, Diego, who are you? That's the first, first question for you. <laughs> Quite difficult question, but uh, I will try to give the, the simplest possible answer. Um, well, I studied philosophy during my BA, and I recently f uh, finished a master's degree also in philosophy, which was focused mainly on several aspects of analytic philosophy, one of the topics that we will discuss today. And my main area of research right now is an area called philosophy of mind, which tries to uh, investigate which, what is the nature of the mind and of our mental activities and how these are related to the brain. So it's a pleasure to be here in your channel. I am looking forward to your questions. All right, so uh, I bet that for many, um, some of the words you just said, um, you know, are sort of new, or at least uh, not in isolation, but just together, um, such as analytic philosophy, because um, right. for people who are more acquainted with philosophy, yeah, we sort of have an idea uh, what this means, but um, I think it's much better to bring someone, or to, yeah, to have someone explain to everyone in the simple terms, okay, what is analytic philosophy? Well, uh, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> I would say that there is consensus that this is a, a fair question, but there is no consensus on the answer. Uh, and this is because analytic philosophy, uh, it's very difficult to characterize. Uh, I think that a good starting point is to uh, say that it is a sort of philosophical tradition it is not properly speaking a school because there is no common uh, research program in which the uh, participants of this tradition are, are ascribe to. Um, this is some sort of loosely based uh, affiliation to a certain way of doing things. Okay. Um, what kind of things? <laughs> Uh, that, that's, another, that's another excellent <laughs> question. There is no <laughs> consensus on which are the things that should be considered when doing analytic philosophy. Mm -hmm. But I think that maybe a very short or brief historical introduction might give us some highlights or some uh, oh. uh, interesting aspects um, of analytic philosophy. Mm, I would say that uh, it is possible to trace the origins of analytic philosophy to the works of people such as Bertrand Russell, George Edward Moore, and Rudolf Carnap, among others, um, during the early decades of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The loosely shared aim of these people was to analyze complex views and ideas using the tools uh, offered by symbolic logic. And this kind of logic mainly developed by Gottlob Frege, also by mm -hmm. Russell himself and by Alfred Whitehead, uh, allowed philosophers and logicians of the time to provide a formal presentation of complex forms of uh, reasoning and 
the internal relations of the propositions that we generally use. Mm -hmm. The initial success of this procedure is what gives rise to the name analytic philosophy, because one right. of the tasks of the employment of uh, symbolic logic was to perform an analysis that is a sort of breakdown of this complex idea. And this procedure and its success highlighted the importance of uh, logic in, uh, for reasoning in general and for delivering rigorous uh, and a clear uh, research output. Mm -hmm. it, it's very interesting what you're saying because uh, normally among people who are more acquainted with uh, these developments in philosophy, uh, but that are not really into analytic philosophy in particular, um, they get this rep reputation you are highlighting that, okay, you know, analytic philosophy is these guys who formalize everything in terms of logic, uh, and that's it. But uh, is that still the case right now? What, what would you say? I would, I would say that the importance of logic has not abandoned the, 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 the minds of those who call themselves analytic philosophers. And I would also say that uh, the importance of logic has acquired a sort of methodological meaning. Uh, logic is used as a sort of tool or instrument, uh, as an organon, as we would, <laughs> as, as people working in ancient philosophy would say. Um, happy with this word. And the the aim of using this tool is, as I mentioned before, to deliver the clearest and most rigorous research output possible. Mm -hmm. So the use of logic and the central role logic uh, aims to, to, to deliver in, in analytic philosophy is mainly a methodological uh, role. Um, even though uh, it must be said, logic itself is also a research topic. There is an area of analytic philosophy called uh, philosophy of logic in which logic becomes the subject matter or the, the topic of research instead of only a methodological tool. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. All right. So um, what would you say um, then if there's no consensus, but rather, okay, they started as logicians and, and as people who were analyzing both logic and language even. Yes. Um, to you know, get uh, to 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 the root of the problems. Let's say uh, that was a hope. Um, but what would you say is the, the common factor uh, the all these uh, people have? Because if you read all the analytic philosophers you've you've mentioned, and even those that came after them, it's hard to find um, a central position. Since because okay, you said it's not school because mm -hmm. schools normally have a set of theses, and they. Right. Uh, push them forward to the last consequences, something we don't see in analytic philosophy. So uh, what would you say is the common factor uh, between all these people? If there is one, and all this right. is a big if, um, I would point out the, the intention of not being called an, a continental philosopher. Uh, I would <laughs> what is say a continental that, philosopher, by the way? Uh, yeah, so, the, uh, so people can learn that that's, as well. That's uh, a, a fairly common uh, point suggested by analytic philosophers. Uh, but analytic philosophy may be distinguished from uh, the so-called continental philosophy, which might be loosely characterized as another tradition. Uh, continental philosophy uh, was also born more or less during the same period of time which is the beginning of the 20th century, although we can trace its roots uh, to 19th century philosophers such as uh, mm -hmm. Nietzsche or Schopenhauer. Yeah. Um, and this tradition uh, receives its name from a geographical location. The founding fathers of continental philosophy worked and lived in continental Europe. Mm -hmm. Yet it is 
very, very difficult to determine precisely whether this name, continental philosophy, uh, designates a single and unified uh, tradition. Um, it is important to note that uh, several of the most prominent authors in uh, usually linked to continental philosophy, uh, such as once again, uh, Hegel, Nietzsche, uh, Schopenhauer, Edmund Husserl, uh, did not think or assume that they were following some sort of common agenda or uh, research program. That said, it is quite reasonable to consider the works of Edmund Husserl as, uh, and his proposal of a phenomenological method as the historical starting point of continental philosophy. Yeah. And here comes a key difference with analytic philosophy. The phenomenological method chiefly or mainly uh, focuses on how the world appears to us. And therefore it, it initially adopts uh, a sort of first person perspective in talking about our experience of the world. While uh, even though analytic philosophy does consider uh, subjective experiences as a possible uh, subject matter or, or, or the topic of a research uh, program. Analytic philosophy, given its methodological uh, tools and the, the role it assigns to, to logical analysis, tends to adopt a sort of third person perspective uh, in many of its, uh, of its analysis and proposals. Uh, here is an interesting suggestion. I know very little about continental philosophy, so maybe uh, what I'm about to say will, uh, will trigger many, but- We'll see that in the comments later. Yeah, <laughs> but it is a very interesting question to see whether uh, the continental philosophers are able to say something that goes beyond the boundaries of a, a first person perspective. Because in their, sort, in, in their aim of making our experiences of the world clearer, um, there is the risk of uh, falling in or of delivering a, an analysis or an explanation about things that are only pertain to one individual. That is the individual from whose experience we are starting from. Um, right, which would be the, the early attempts in phenomenology, for instance. Yes, yes. Now, now we have all the branches of continental philosophy, something for a, for a future video. Uh, I'll try to find someone <laughs> right. who's also knowledgeable on that side to, you know, to balance uh, what we are saying, because um, as you're saying, yeah, um, analytic philosophy is born from or as a response to uh, continental philosophy. So it's like, okay, we don't want to be like them. Um, so, okay, in, in more tangible or practical things, how do they distance themselves from, from the continental ones? What makes them so different? And what makes them, you know, wanting to be different from them? Well, first of all, there is no longer a geographical distinction. Uh, all right, yes. Analytic sure. philosophy and continental philosophy, if these are fair names to be uh, used in for the contemporary state of affairs, um, does not necessarily apply to a geographical situation. Uh, continental philosophy nowadays is not restricted to continental Europe and analytic philosophy is certainly not restricted or exclusively practiced in Anglo-speaking countries. Uh, the two styles or these two traditions in doing philosophy are practiced in countries all over the world. So I would say first that the difference between traditions nowadays is no longer a, a geographical distinction. Um, the, the strongest point or, or the strongest 
a candidate to be a difference, I would say is this uh, distinction between first person perspective and third person perspective, because uh, both traditions more or less cover or investigate the same topics. Right. We can yeah. find ethics in, in both traditions or moral research in both traditions. Both traditions also do research in logic. Uh, both traditions uh, have philosophy of history, for example, or philosophy of law, uh, metaphysics, uh, a theory of knowledge, so on. And philosophy so of mathematics as well, you can find uh, exactly. people like that who are analytics, I think, they are more famous in that branch, like, I don't know, Ben Asaraf, uh, yeah, these kind of people, but then you also have Alain Badiou uh, in the in the French tradition, who also gets his hands into mathematics, and then yeah, uh, the approach is is yeah, is starkingly different. Exactly. So I I I wouldn't put uh, the sort of research program or list of topics uh, that may be uh, investigated as a key difference. The difference seems to be methodological, and the difference seems to be in uh, how much faith can we put into the third person perspective. Right. Because it is clear to me that we have uh, a first person perspective. Th th that is fairly obvious. Uh, I, I think that the challenge for analytic philosophy is trying to show that we can go beyond that first person perspective and that we can find some sort of common ground uh, upon which uh, build some sort of notion of objectivity, for example, uh, or, or try to ground the validity of certain reasonings. Um, in this sort of common ground. Uh, I would say that many, not all, of course, there must be exceptions, uh, continental philosophers are skeptic about the possibility of achieving uh, a very strong third person perspective, uh, mm -hmm. strong enough to ground, for example, an interpersonal or not, not interpersonal, but an um, a sort of metaphysics, for example, or ontology that doesn't depend on our standing in the world. Um, right. Which was Husserl's, for instance, main difficulty when trying to, to build an entire system from this uh, right. essential of, uh, of the external world. Yes, yes. Yes, I understand. Now, okay, uh, one question that we didn't have in, in agenda, I'd say that, but that now I think about it. Um, there are some languages, um, because I know that people who watch this channel are also some, a number of them are polyglots. And um, when I think, for instance, in, in French as a language, uh, for cultural reasons and also what is regarded as, a, in, as an intelligent or well-cultured style, um, you need to phrase things in more complex ways or maybe using complex terms or by being... Um, extensive, let's say, in, in, in the way you, you say things. Uh, how much do you think that language influences um, uh, or has influenced uh, the particular style or philosophical development in each of these uh, countries have, ha have had? Because if you think of English, it's a fairly straightforward and very economical uh, kind of language. Mm -hmm. So um, it's no surprise to me to see this correlation between a very uh, direct and concise language with the uh, emergence of uh, analytic philosophy? I would say that the current state of affairs mm -hmm. in which analytic philosophy is mainly uh, done in English, um, it's not because English has a sort of special property that uh, renders it more um, accessible or compatible with analytic philosophy. I think it's uh, the use of English in analytic philosophy may be simply explained due to historical reasons, but not due to uh, deep reasons concerning the syntactic or semantic structure of the language. Uh, the same goes for the languages in which uh, the founding fathers of continental philosophy did uh, their, their kind of research. Uh, 
uh, German and French do not possess special properties that make them more compatible with uh, continental philosophy. Um, so um, I would say that the correlation between one tradition and a certain language is uh, purely contingent. And it, mm -hmm. and it may be explained due to historical and geographical reasons, uh, especially uh, the ones pertaining to the moments in which these traditions originated. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, so just a pure correlation, let's say. Right. Uh, that, you that, could, that's your view. In it. Uh, that said, you could, in theory, do uh, or perform analytic philosophy in French. It's perfectly mm -hmm. plausible. Uh, or or analytic philosophy in German, um, and there there will be no problem about it. Um, mm -hmm. And you could uh, write and do research in continental philosophy in English. So yes. there's no. As it happens in the UK, for instance. As I, as Precisely. I okay. All right. So one last thing, uh, because um, well, as you will know, um, many many of the people who watch. Uh, this channel also are uh, passionate about uh, ancient Greece. Um, so uh, I would like now to share experiences because uh, from your side, from from the from the side of analytic philosophy, <clears throat> um, what do you think um, analytic philosophy can say or can contribute to uh, the studies of um, of ancient philosophy in this case, and and then I can tell you what's been my experience here. Because uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, yeah, I'm I'm studying uh, now my PhD in the UK in ancient philosophy. So uh, I may have some things to say, but I want to our interviewee to to have uh, his own standpoint, and then we can compare. Right. Um, I would say that uh, the main contribution of uh, analytic philosophy. Uh, to ancient philosophy or, or to the field of ancient philosophy is uh, mainly methodological. Uh, analytic philosophers are, or were at least the ones at the beginning of the 20th century, very interested in uh, clarifying as much as we can uh, what we want to say. Um, in fact, Many, many traditional problems in philosophy were considered to be uh, pseudo problems or only problems of language, given yeah. our uh, inability to express ourselves in a precise and clear way. Uh, yeah. So um, the idea of employing logic to formalize our ideas and to express them in a more clear way is a sort of theme that is constantly present in, 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 in the works or, or kind of research that people in analytic tradition uh, would like to attempt. And that theme may be perfectly applied to someone doing research in uh, ancient philosophy. Uh, so that will be the first uh, aspect. And the second aspect is not only logical. There are certain theories or proposals that have been uh, developed in the bosom of analytic philosophy that might shed certain light or new light on, on problems that, um, that have for a long time been sort of on hold in in ancient philosophy. For example, a given theory in metaphysics might shed some light on one particular interpretation of an ancient text mm -hmm. and therefore use that new theory as an additional reason to adopt that interpretation. Right, yes. What about the other way around? What do you see? Do analytic philosophers read ancient philosophy and get inspired or influenced? They sure do, because uh, ancient philosophy is considered a source of excellent ideas. Uh, these ideas, of course, given their historical context, were not delivered 
in an analytical package, uh, but uh, the idea uh, can certainly be translated uh, into uh, or with or using the the analytical tools. Mm -hmm. So uh, nowadays in analytic philosophy is not um, at all strange to find certain people that call themselves Aristotelians or Platonists. Right. Uh, uh, these are people that uh, find inspiration, some sort of inspiration in the ideas of authors from the past. Right. They take their ideas and their research programs and they try to sort of translate them or update them in order to bring them to the contemporary discussions on any given topic. So there is a constant uh, dialogue between people working on, on certain areas uh, of analytic philosophy, such as philosophy of mathematics or philosophy of time, and people working in ancient philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think you're most certainly right uh, with uh, what you're saying. And from my personal experience, because uh, people know here that my first language uh, such as is the same as yours, is Spanish. And um, I would say that the way of studying ancient philosophy uh, back in, in, in Chile, where I studied, uh, where we studied, <laughs> um, it's, um, how to say, it's, it's more continental friendly, I would say but yeah. not exclusively continental. Um, and by this, I mean that, I, this is my perception of the matter. If you disagree, comment in the video, like I'm happy to, 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 to get any critiques uh, on this, but um, there's um, a great focus in the continental style in the interpretation of the texts and the sheer interpretation, like, okay, let's sort of say, okay, let's squeeze the text and see what we can, understand or further develop from there. But uh, when I came here to do my master's uh, here to the UK, um, I quickly realized in the first semester that the way I was writing uh, in my essays was you know, immediately tackled um, with comments such as, for instance, a sentence too long, uh, or you can say this in, in fewer words. Uh, this could be down. more clear. Yeah, break it down. This could be more clear. And in the first essays, I remember infinite, infinite, uh, <laughs> endless uh, comments of, of this sort. And then on the next term, okay, I already learned. And that shows a lot the the philosophical culture here of, yeah, as you were saying, breaking down stuff. If you can say it clearer, please do. Uh, but not a please uh, as a suggestion. No, it's, a, it's a <laughs> almost mandatory because the shorter and the clearer, the better. That's the, I would say, the motto. Uh, for us in, 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 in ancient philosophy here. And the other one is that, yeah, people here are not allergic to formalize uh, certain arguments. Um, it, when you try to deliver something in the most clear way, uh, use uh, the use of um, variables such as uh, X and Y, let's say they're properties, and they interact in a, they have a relation uh, between them. So X, R, Y um, kind of thing that it's, you know, uh, uh, a common currency in, in, in ancient philosophy, uh, sorry, in analytic philosophy. Um, in ancient philosophy that a uh, hundred years ago, you, you would never see something like that. Like people were, you know, working with the Greek text exclusively and trying to either interpret or, you know, to, to, to break down things, but not to the extent or in the style that um, analytic philosophy was at the time developing. And nowadays, yeah, you, you can tell a huge difference between, um, okay, I'm gonna generalize, of course, as you were saying before, there must be exceptions. Um, but if you check an ancient philosophy journal in English and an ancient philosophy journal in Italian or in French, um, you, you can see the difference in style. Yeah. It's, 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 it, I think it's dramatic in the sense of, okay, in, in English, it's pretty much like an analytic philosophy papers in which, okay, you formalize if you can, but you try to, to keep it short, to keep it brief, to keep it clear. And there's an aim for clarity. In, in, in the French style, the ones I've engaged in, um, what I read is, okay, it's an interpretation and, and they're longer papers normally. 
um, uh, but the focus is on the interpretation. And in the Italian ones, for instance, there's a huge, huge focus on the historical context of, um, of the problems or the philosophers. You, you, you tend to learn sometimes things of the uncle of the philosopher <laughs> which you're reading. And I think that, uh, it's fascinating because it's hard to say which one is better in the end, at least from my, from my side, because you can get very useful stuff from all these styles. Um, but, but yeah, the difference in method, as you were saying, more than in content, it's a difference, yes, it's a methodological difference. And, and yeah, one that I think it's been worth exploring. And, and yeah, in the end, many people, I include myself in this, we tend to have to, to balance that and have a middle ground because uh, we, we see benefits in, in, in many of these branches. So, so yeah, I, I don't know um, if you have anything else to, to add to this. Uh, well, I would certainly say that after the end of the 20th century, and now we are at the beginning of the 21st century, mm -hmm. uh, the communications and dialogue between the so-called continental philosophers and the so-called analytic philosophers is quite fluent. Um, and the division or the gulf between these traditions is not as clear as it was at the beginning of the 20th century. In fact, yeah. I have also encountered uh, many people who have suggested that both of these traditions may complement each other because they are simply different layers of analysis or, or different layers of research on the same topic. Uh, on the one hand, you are uh, doing research on the relation between the phenomenon under study and yourself, uh, your experience about the, the, the topic of research, and the other, the, the so-called analytic perspective, is a sort of attempt to generalize that conclusion and to see up to what extent uh, you can do that generalization um, and therefore obtain a conclusion that applies not only to the initial case or the initial cases under study, but that also apply to the same cases that might appear in the future or uh, the cases that uh, occur in other contexts. Yes, I understand. Well, I think that would be it for, for today. Uh, I want to thank you very, 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 no, thank very, you. very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I'm glad you had a, a, a fun time. And, and, and yeah, I, ho I hope for people now, uh, this distinction is clear because um, uh, many years ago, uh, there was like a certain, um, um, they, they were sort of considered enemies, you know, analytics and continentals. And uh, I think that it's a good thing that now we're reaching a more peaceful kind of environment and appreciating the contributions of both. Um, so yeah, I hope this was clear for everyone. I want to thank again, Diego for uh, his presence and his insights, always, always a pleasure. And yeah, okay, see you everyone next time. And uh, yeah, please leave comments if you have any questions, critiques or anything. I'll try to reply as soon as I can. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.